Welcome to the Hockey Writers Prospect Corner, a show with our top prospects writing crew, bringing you the latest news, analysis, scouting reports, mocks, rankings, and much more. From the world juniors to the NHL draft floor, from the farm to the NHL, our team covers everything that happens in the world of prospects. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready for Prospect Corner. Prospect Corner. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another Prospect Corner presented by the Hockey Writers. I'm your host, Matthew Zader. And once again, I'm joined by my co-hosts and fellow Prospect experts, Peter Berrettini and Greg Boysen. Uh, we're also very happy to be joined by Nick Richard from Dauber Prospects. He's the director of North American Scouting. And he's also the writer for Leaf Nation. Uh, hey, Nick, uh, thanks for joining the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so as you can probably th- predict... We are doing the Toronto Maple Leafs on the show today. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, we've gone through the Vancouver Canucks, Montreal Canadiens in our uh, deep dive portion of the first four episodes of this uh, prospects-centric uh, show. Um, and of course, thank you for joining us in the first first three episodes. Uh, we got quite a bit uh, of views in the last first three. So thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, in this new show as always, if you enjoy the show, um, just make sure you're subscribing to our YouTube channel and uh, hitting that notification bell so you don't miss out on any future episodes. And be sure to also check out the other YouTube shows on our um, on our channel because we have quite a few now. Added a couple more this past week, uh, Howlers and Growlers, Arizona Coyotes show, and uh, folks on the Flyers, uh, Philadelphia Flyers uh, show as well. So we're growing and it's exciting to have uh, a few other shows on the network. So also make sure you're subscribing to our morning skate newsletter as well. There's a lot of news there at morning skate.io. So um, let's jump in to the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, prospects pool, uh, starting with their top prospects. Um, of course, everyone probably can guess this. It's Nick Robertson. Yeah. Uh, he's the number one prospect on the Maple Leafs. Uh, I'm a Vancouver Canucks writer. I know this. <laughs> and uh you know he he is the top he is the top guy there hoping to make the roster a full-time capacity this uh this season um we're gonna start with that is this the year he does make the maple leafs in a full-time role does he have a legitimate shot at doing this we'll start with uh, our guest nick uh what do you think well i thought kyle dubas's answer uh, to that question was kind of interesting the other day he, he said he's got no preconceived notion for where Robertson is going to play this year, whether that's in the NHL or with the Marlies in the American League, um, and noted that the competition is wide open, especially on the left side. That being said, there's a lot of bodies up front right now, guys with NHL experience under their belts, and I, I think Robertson's going to be in tough to you know surpass those guys, given the fact that he's exempt from waivers and you know, he, he's still got some developing to do as well. So another stint down with the Marlies might not be the worst thing, but you know, he's so skilled. He can kind of change the game at a moment's notice with that shot. So he's a guy that could show well enough through the preseason to earn one of those spots on the left side, I think. Yeah. I mean, I've followed his, his uh, career since he was drafted and uh, he's a very skilled prospect. I mean, you're looking at he, you know, there is some space in the top, that top six with Zach Hyman gone. Um, he does a legitimate chance of doing that. Uh, Peter, what do you think on, on uh, Robertson there? Yeah, the competition is going to be really tough, especially with the signings that they made, bringing in Michael Bunting and Nick Ritchie, who's going to be battling for that top six role on the left-hand side. You still have, you know, Ilya Mikheyev, who's going to be possibly in the bottom six role, possibly going in that third line spot. So other than that, you're not going to play it a player like Nick Robertson on the fourth line, or maybe the third. I mean, best case scenario, he's still going to be that energy kind of guy going in uh, into the corners, setting up an an attack, using his shot, using his creativity and everything like that. Um, Like Nick mentioned, if, if, if he has to go down to the minors for another year, just to develop and, you know, just continue to grow and mature as a player. Great. But we saw his confidence during the development camp, carried over into the rookie tournament. This guy is on a mission. And I think anything less of making the roster, he may see it as, you know, a kind of a failure at this point, because we know how he has that drive, that determination. So 
to us, it's probably a good thing. Maybe if he doesn't, but for him, he may see it otherwise because he knows how great of a prospect he is and we've seen it. So very difficult. Um, if he does, great. I mean, he, he you don't come out of training camp and earn a roster spot just because for the sake of earning a spot, he put his best foot forward. So if he does that, that's going to be great for him. Yeah, he was impressive in the that prospects tournament, uh, and that's a great, a great step um, pushing off point for him. And we'll see how he does the rest of camp uh, and in the preseason as well. So, Greg, uh, let's finish it off. Uh, what do you think about Robertson's chances on the roster this year? I think he has a legitimate shot to make it out of camp, but I don't. I think it's going to more depend, not necessarily on how he performs in camp and preseason but how they want to construct the roster more so than his performance, so to speak, unless he just, just wows everybody and there's no way you can keep him off. You know, I like his game. And if you watched last week's Canadian episodes, you know that I hate the stigma attached to guys who are under six feet tall, but let's face it. It's still a thing. He's only five foot nine to me. That doesn't make a difference, but the Leafs have quite a few guys already under six feet tall on that roster. So if they want a bigger guy up front on that construction, uh, uh, you know, their roster construction, they want to go for size. They want to go for experience. He may be the odd man out just because he doesn't have either of those things right now. And uh, so I think that's going to be the biggest factor, how they want to build that opening night roster. And we, as we know, as guys who have, you know, covered the game and written about prospects. You don't necessarily dress your best 18 players to start the season. You best, you, yeah. you, you, you build a team. So he may, and as you both said, another season in the NHL, it probably is the best thing for him, unless he's just out of this world. Fantastic. And he still may be during the, during training camp, but, uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's ultimately going to come down to how they want to construct that roster to start the season. But I think at some point this year, he's going to be in, you know, the NHL locker room instead of the AHL side of town. That's the thing. I mean, injuries happen during the season, too. I mean, there's guys that that go down in the top six. And like you said, Peter, they're, you know, when you're going into with the way, amount of skill that he has and his creativity, he's probably more suited to be in that top six or at least the top nine. Right. So. Uh, we'll see what happens in that rest of camp and the preseason, and uh, we'll see if he can actually uh, win a spot. Let's move on to another top prospect in the Leafs organization is Rodion Amira. Uh, he was first round pick in 2020. Uh, very impressive. I wrote his profile back then, and he is a very skilled player. Uh, very offensive. Again, top six guy. Could even be a top line guy in his prime. Um, what does he have have to do to keep impressing? And how how do you think he's impressed so far? Uh, Peter, we'll start with you. I mean, he's still got to utilize his vision. I mean, that's what makes him so great, both in the offensive zone and defensively. I mean, this guy has the vision to move up, find an open spot, make a great pass. So he, his head is always on a swivel. He knows what's going on constantly. And even uh, like you, Matt, um, writing the draft pieces, writing the pit possible picks for the Maple Leafs, I had Rodion Amirov in that spot where they were picking him 15th. Given the fact that he has that two-way game, that mentality, he's great on the penalty kill. And granted that he missed, uh, he looked great in the preseason, missed some time because of an injury, came back, uh, I mean, granted one assist, very nice assist at that in one game, so point per game already. I mean, don't look yeah. too much into that because it's only one game. <laughs> but, I mean, you have to look at the positives of what he's done throughout his junior career, even last year after they drafted him. I mean, given the fact that, you know, not earning a lot of minutes in the KHL, um, you know, barely playing third, fourth line minutes, he still made the most of his opportunity. And the fact that he's getting more of that chance right now, we're seeing his true potential. And granted, he's still young, still lots of time to develop. But the Maple Leafs, I mean, a lot of people were complaining that, oh, here we go. You know, they didn't draft a player like Braden Schneider or, you know, someone else. And I was probably one of those players that liked Braden Schneider. But drafting Rory Namirov, who was the best player available, you go with the best player available. We're seeing that right now. So his progression, I think he's taken a really major step forward. And I think it's only going to be a matter of time before maybe he comes over across in North America, maybe get some time with the Marlies at some point. Um, until that happens, if he's staying there in Russia to further round out his game and you know, get more comfortable at that senior level, just going to go well for him no matter what. 
Yeah, I mean, I saw it. We're seeing it in Vancouver with Pud Colson a couple seasons in the KHL, and he looks amazing in camp. Uh, so, I mean, like it's NHL not a ready. bad thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's not a bad thing for him to play uh, another year over there and and then come over. So, I mean, it's not bad at all. Uh, Greg, what do you think? How does he have to keep impressing, uh, you know, develop his game? I think Peter touched a little bit on it. I think his biggest attributes uh, is his t- two-way game you know it's impressive for a player of his age to to think in all areas of the ice and that's so key in today's game and and he does have that hockey sense hockey IQ he just sees the game at, at an elite level uh things seem to slow down for him at times on the ice uh and that's something you really can't coach that's just natural ability so those are things to be excited about for sure um, but just like any other young player, and uh, people are going to start accusing me of sounding like a broken record on this show, but <laughs> he needs to get just a tad bit faster and a tad bit stronger before he really can, you know, uh, cement a place in the NHL. But you're still at least a season or two away before that happens. I know um, these young European players playing, you know, in the KHL or, or, the, or the Swedish league, Finland, wherever, it's not the most ideal situation because it's, especially in the KHL, it's so hard for these young talented players to get meaningful minutes yeah. uh, w- w- on top lines. And that could be an hindrance, but playing professional against grown men, against some of the best players in the world. Yeah. The KHL isn't the NHL, but it's still a pretty darn good league. You still got some hall of fame quality players you're playing against night in night out. It's not, you know, it's not a bad thing. So, uh, you know, a- another season, in the KHL is not going to be the worst thing in the world. I'm sure the Leafs would rather have him, you know, here in the AHL at the very least, but you know, that's, those are the hurdles you have to cross when you, when you draft those young Russian players. So, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being patient with your, with your prospects, especially, you know, when you've got a, an NHL club, that's, you know, already in a pretty good spot. You can take your time with your youngsters. Yeah, for sure. And that's, you. that's what's good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I think the, the beauty of the situation with Amirov now is that the Leafs do have him under contract when they sign him to the entry level deal this, uh, this past summer or spring actually so he's actually on loan over in the KHL now mm-hmm. they've got a little bit more control over what happens with him if they aren't happy with his deployment over there they do have the ability to pull the plug on that and get him over to North America if they choose to do so I think there's probably a bit of a mutual agreement between him and the team given his age to you know kind of yeah. keep him over closer to home for at least another year but I suspect depending when Ufa's season wraps up in the KHL however far they go I think Amir I will probably play some games with the Marlies this season yeah, for sure. And uh, Nick, do you have anything else to add about his game or, or has it been uh, completely covered? Do you have any other insights? <laughs> know, those guys covered it pretty well. <laughs> yeah. um, I watched his uh, his return to action uh, yesterday. It, Pete alluded to the fact that Amirov was looking really strong in the preseason. It seemed like he kind of had an inside track on the, a, a top six spot. And then uh, injury kind of derailed that. He missed the first bit of the season there. And ironically, Ufa brought in Nikolai Kuhlman, who's been filling a top six role uh, in the meantime. But in Amirov's first game back, he played almost 12 minutes on the third line playing right wing. He uh, he didn't look out of place by any means. I thought he was good along the boards. And as Greg and Peter said, it's the brain. He's often in the right place at the right time. If you go back and watch like any of his goals from last season in the KHL, a lot of the time it's it's opportunistic like he's the puck's coming to him in the slot because he got into space at the right time and he's got the shot to finish from those areas as well as the vision to set up his teammates in space as we saw yesterday so I'm really excited about Amirov I do think it's going to be probably a year or two before he's like knocking on the NHL door Uh, but there's a lot to be excited about with his game yeah and like I've I've watched him too and he's yeah he's a pretty amazing talent I think he's going to become that top six threat and uh you know i mean top line guy as well so but like we said maple leafs don't necessarily need him right now uh they got some good talent to that top six right now already so (laughs) (laughs) someone by the name or two players by the that have uh m last name so (laughs) remind remind all the leafs fans of that matt 
<laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that you do. You have two mostly <laughs> talented players. Don't drive them out of town. <laughs> Tell Twitter um, that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole show. That's a whole other show. Maybe <laughs> yeah, Lounge has sure hits a lot on that one. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll, leave, we'll leave that to them. <laughs> um, next is another prospect that uh, was drafted this year, 2021. Not a first round pick. The Maple Leafs did not have a first round pick this year. Um, much to the chagrin of some people that they didn't have another first round pick, but uh, they got a pretty good one in Matthew Nyes in the second round. So I think he was a first round talent. Um, look at the selection itself. Was he the best fit for the Maple Leafs in here, or is there another player you ha- you think they should have picked? Uh, we'll start with you, with you, Greg. Um, I think, as you alluded to, he was a first round talent that that dropped, uh, um, and you know he kind of had a really slow start in the USHL after a really good 2019-20 uh, season. He had that COVID. You know, positive COVID, you know, uh, dealings early, and that really slowed him down. But that second half of the season, he showed why so many people were high on him. I think he had what he had 13, 13 goals and twenty nine points in the final twenty three games of of the season. So he came on late, and I think that uh, affected him a bit. But this was such a goofy draft, and and we've talked about that a lot, and and we've all <laughs> written about it that. We all knew that there were going to be guys that were going to get taken way higher than they would have in a normal year and guys that were going to drop just because it's just such an uncertain, crazy year. And I think he's part of that second category. Um, I think it was obvious the type of player they wanted with that pick. They had a certain somebody who we'll talk about here shortly that they obviously felt was going to be out the door and they wanted to get somebody, a uh, big physical player that can score Um and, and play, you know, do the dirty work for the talented players on that top line. And I think if that's what you were looking for, then you got exactly that in this pick, but I, I, I don't want to ruin uh, two questions from now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. He, I liked the pick when the, when the Maple Leafs picked him, and I was really surprised that he dropped into the second round, honestly. And uh so, I mean, but that, like, like you said, Greg, there's so many guys that dropped in that draft that were supposed to be first round picks, uh, second round picks dropped down to the third and fourth round, uh, look at past a job, how far he dropped. So, I mean, that, this draft was very weird in, uh, in that case, but Maple Leafs got a good one in eyes. Uh, Peter, we'll go with to you on this one. Expectations for him. Uh, what are you projecting him to be? I mean, he, is, he looks like a power forward type. Uh, player and like you said he's gritty he you know that type of player what is it what do you think about his expectations and his projection it's really difficult because yeah he's being labeled as a power forward but he's got so much more than just being that big body guy to go in and on the four check instead of that attack and battle along the corners and along the wall He's very smart defensively. He's got excellent soft hands to make moves in tight. He's got a powerful shot, so he can do it all. So I, I, power, two-way power forward. I don't know. Can we make that, you know, distinction <laughs> right now for him? Because he's got a lot of, he's got a lot of attributes that like, you know, bodes well with what the Maple Leafs want to do. He's skilled. Granted that, you know, Maple Leafs have gone with smaller players. He's got, He's got the size that, you know, they've lacked and people complained about in the draft, you know, 6'3", 205 pounds. I mean, doesn't get more out of, like, context for Kyle Dubas in his projected draft, you know, uh, strategy to draft smaller skill players. He's got a bigger skill forward where he has the skating ability. He has the talent. He has, the, the, again, the qualities that this team values and they're relying so heavily on skill but also being responsible so i think this is the major projection that they hope for and for him to be a top six forward i mean definitely a a top six talent to be in the first round like you mentioned again weird year a lot of unfortunate situations but he still maintained his status to be a top you know 60 player that's really good and for to still find that kind of value in that range in the second round I don't want to say he struck goal, but it's one of the better picks of that round. Maybe not the best, but still excellent value for the Maple Leafs. Yeah. I like the two Matthews that were in this draft, uh, Matthew Coronado and Matthew Nye. So as you can see, my name 
Same yeah. same spelling in both ways. No too. bias there. They must be good. Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, go to you on this one, Nick. Uh, he's going to play with another talented player, Chaz Chaz Lucius, on the University of Minnesota this year. Um, do you think how well is he going to do with that uh, with with Lucius? I'm really interested to see kind of how he progresses as a freshman at uh, Minnesota this year. You know, it's not exactly like the KHL, but a lot of times the freshmen aren't given, you know, the, the biggest roles coming in. So I, I think that he's a guy that, you know, just all the, the various attributes that he possesses and how well-rounded his game is, the fact that he's a bit more mature physically as well. I think he's someone that could, you know, sneak into a top six role right off the bat as a freshman. It probably started a little bit lower in the lineup, but he's a guy that I think is, is probably going to, he's, he's a coach's player, you know, like that kind of guy that does it all for the team, plays hard, lays hits, can finish the scoring chances. Just a guy that coaches trust and love to use to complement their best players in all situations. And to kind of allude to Pete's point earlier, I think that's the projection that they're hoping for with Matthew Nyes. And it may be not necessarily a guy that drives a first or second line by himself, but the perfect kind of complementary player in the, in a sense, like Zach Hyman was. Yeah. So I, I think that he's got the potential to be that. And the, the fact that he plays a more physical game than almost anyone else in the Leafs organization was a nice little bonus. <laughs> uh, great transition there. I uh, Zach Hyman. <laughs> it's our next question is he the next zach hyman i uh, maple leafs lounge talked about getting a zach hyman clone and free agency trade whatever is he the next zach hyman down the road greg we'll start with you on this one i mean no offense to zach hyman but why stop there why not be better than yeah, zach hyman yeah, yeah, like yeah. i mean zach hyman is a nice player but let's face facts now, I'm not a Maple Leafs fan, so this may be an unpopular opinion, or <laughs> some some may agree with me, but I think Zach Hyman was right place, right time for his skill set. Mm. And I think he's lucked out because he's in another great situation for his skill set in Edmonton, whether he's playing with David or Drysdale. This guy has lucked out with elite talent around him, which has made him his role that much better. But why stop there? Why be you know, the dirty work guy for Austin Matthews. Why not be a really good player that can play with anybody? And I think he can do that. He's got more, I think he's got more offensive ability than Zach Hyman. Sure, he's big and he's mean and he can be that power forward and and do the hard, gritty stuff. But he's also a much more dynamic offensive player than Hyman, I think, has ever been. He showed it at the World Junior Summit Showcase what he can do. He can take over a game. He was a monster in those five games, uh, four goals and seven points. If that's what he can be, why stop at Zach Hyman? Don't be the next Zach Hyman. Be the first Matthew Needs. That's what I say. (laughs) Yeah, and (laughs) I've said before about, I've said before about comparing players to players and I feel that's always unfair uh, for players and, or even, you know, p- pigeonholing them a bit and look at nice is six, three, Zach Hyman, six, one. So they've got some bigger size there too. So I mean, Hyman, Hyman doesn't play that way. He doesn't play. Yeah. That way, you know. Yeah. Hyman's physical, but he doesn't like more. blow guys up the way that Matthew Nyes has done yeah. like to this point in his career either. So uh, yeah, I kind of agree with, I love what Greg said there about Matthew Nyes. Why stop there? Yeah. So, uh, Peter, you have anything to add to that? Uh, is he the next Zach Hyman or? Yeah. I mean, gr- yeah. To agree with Greg as well. I mean, why stop there? I think, I think mainly because there's a lot of comparisons to Zach Hyman in terms of that work ethic mentality, you know, being not necessarily a driving force, but being a key factor. And I think Matthew Nye sits the same mold as Zach Hyman, but as, as Greg mentioned, and seeing clips of him during before and during the draft as well, he's got better hands. He's got a better shot. I mean, I've seen him break away from the op- opponent. Zach Hyman doesn't necessarily have the best speed and best skating, you know, technical stride, if you want to call it. N- nice does have that. And the fact that he's able to go in and make moves in tight, something that Zach Hyman really doesn't do, as Zach Hyman is just a, you know, greasy goal kind of guy. Nice has that, you know, skill set. He has the ability to be flashy at certain points. Um, so yeah, that's 
like in terms of Zach Hyman, the best thing is the work ethic, but he brings a, a whole lot more to the table. Yeah. Uh, finish off the discussion. Do you have anything else to add, Nick, or uh, are we? No. <laughs> I, I think those guys summed it up pretty well again. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I don't want to feel like we're doing the, the Zach Hyman slander hour, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I love what Pete said. Like I, I, I said it about Matty Beneers last year uh, leading into the draft, like, working hard is a skill and yeah. i think like a guy like zach hyman uh, was kind of like elite in that regard so yeah yeah you nailed it uh work ethic is it's one thing i always look for in a player when i'm when i'm looking at their skill set and it's always something i gravitate to because work yeah work ethic is a skill it's something that not everyone has and yeah. if you and a lot of the times you don't have it you're not going to go as far as someone that does uh, that does have that work ethic and that, you know, just, just does the work, um, you know, so, and Nice definitely has that Hyman has that. So, I mean, there's the comparison, like you guys said. Um, so we'll see what happens. I, I think he, I agree with all of you. I think he has a lot more skill than Hyman as well. So not the same that Hyman is not a bad player. He's, he's a great, great player in what he does as well. So, um, so we've hit a half point, late point in the show. Uh, this is the prospects corner by the hockey writers. Again, if you enjoy this show, please subscribe um, to the YouTube channel. Like I said, there's a lot of great shows on there. Uh, we got the Grind Line, Detroit Maple, Detroit Maple Leafs. Oh my God, Detroit Red <laughs> Love <Lane>. that team. <laughs> oh, Pat and I hear that one. Uh, <laughs> Grind Line, Detroit Red Wings show, uh, Maple Leafs Lounge, Blackhawks Banter, Chicks and Sticks, and a lot of others. Like I said, the new shows that are out there as well. And check out thehockeywriters.com for all the writing that these guys do as well. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on preseason training camp. All of it's, you know, training camp's going on already. Preseason's coming up. Uh, Maple Leafs have their first game coming coming soon here. So there's a lot going to be talking about uh, on this show and on the other shows as well. So uh, stay tuned for all that. We'll move on here. Other names in the system that the Maple Leafs have. There's a, we'll start with a guy that's been in the system a bit. We've talked about him on this show in the first episode, Timothy Lilligren. There is a battle that's going on on the Maple Leafs blue line on the right side. Timothy Lilligren is, do you need deep in it? Do you think he's poised to earn that spot or is he going to, going to go back to the AHL, which a lot of people probably don't want to see. Uh, Nick, what do you think on that? I think right now, uh, you know, depending on the way that the Maple Leafs construct their roster and what their cap looks like on opening day, uh, I have Lilligren as the the seventh defenseman right now. I don't think he's at a point where he's he's going to surpass Travis Dermott for the the spot on the third pair on the right side there. Um, I, I think if they keep him as a seventh defenseman, Dermott's versatility kind of allows them to – divide minutes however they see fit between Sandine and Lilligren. I, I think Sandine is obviously going to kind of be the, the guy starting out there on that third role or a third pair, sorry. Um, but he's still a young guy looking to establish himself as a full-time NHLer as well. And I think there'll be plenty of minutes to go around for Lilligren if they want to try and work him into some of those situations there. And, and you know, being the seventh D, he's still only an injury away from playing every night anyway. So I, I, I think, Last year was a strange year for him. He spent a lot of time with the uh, Maple Leafs taxi squad, so he wasn't always with the Marlies and getting into game action. But when he did play with the Marlies last year, it was the first time that I felt like he looked almost too good for that league. He was he was really controlling play from the back end like I hadn't really seen in his first few seasons. Um, just always driving play forward from the back end and defending well when he was forced to on the, on the rare occasions that he was forced to. Uh, I think that the time is now for him to start, you know, seeing a little bit more time at the top level. I don't think he's going to grow into a, a top four NHL defender necessarily, or the, the offensive dynamo that he might have been projected as ahead of his draft year. But he's really rounded out his game. I, I think he's kind of gone from being an offensive defenseman to more uh, defensively minded. Uh, he's really short up that part of his game. So I think, yeah, now's the time to to see what he's got. The clock's kind of ticking on a player like Lilligren because if you keep him in the minors again, 
he's only a valuable prospect for so long, right? Before the shine is totally worn off and you haven't cashed in on his value at all. You know, it, it, the time is now. They've got to see what they've got. Yeah, it's true. And the Canucks have a similar thing with Ole Levy in, in our system. Yeah. And I keep paralleling them because they seem to be the same way. They're kind of on the that's cusp a, and they just keep trying to get there and <laughs> never seem to always have a roadblock in their way. And I'm hoping that both of them can, you know, beat the odds and get there because uh, they are both talented defensemen in their own right. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, next, we're going to talk about Topi Namella. Another Finnish, uh, or no, Lilligren, he's Swedish. Um, yeah, you I'm, in, I'm in the same continent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is he you the just next pissed best off best? all of Finland <laughs> <laughs> and Sweden, <laughs> too? <laughs> you're gonna get some, you're gonna get some nasty messages and some strange languages coming real soon. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're big rivals, so yeah, I'm probably... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Topi Namella. Is he the next best defenseman coming up in the system, Peter? Uh, he's a very talented defenseman too. What do you think? I mean, based on like the depth and what they have, I mean, give, I mean, I still love Timothy Lilligram, but he has fallen down depth charts for me. I mean, he's still close to making it or the potential too, but given overall skill set, given overall potential and ceiling, I think Topi Nimila has it all. I mean, we saw it at the World Juniors last year, him being the top defenseman at the tournament, which really – I, I expected a big tournament from him, but I did not ha- expect him to surpass expectations of what I thought. He was absolutely dynamite. And even seeing it this year right now, he's already up to above a point per game with Carpat in the Liga. One goal, five assists. I mean, he's got a really good shot, but I think his vision and his passing, just it, it's above it, – it's, it's his best attribute. He can make great scene passes, and it just makes even the most difficult situations look so easy to get out of trouble – and locate his teammates. So he has the awareness. He has the vision. He has the smarts, especially defensively too. He's very active in the defensive end, breaking up plays. I, you, given the fact that you know the Maple Leafs went the route with quite a bit of offensive players in years past. I mean, we saw it with uh, Jake Gardner uh, before Tyson Berry. Um, that didn't quite work out, uh, like going all offense from the defense. It does work, but to have that two-way play and that mentality like Topi Nimela has, it, it's going to go well for them. And I really think that he is going to be – I mean, you can still I, – I, I think Rasa Sandin is at that point where we could probably take him out of that top prospect situation right now. But Topi Nimela has definitely probably moved up into that top three conversation at this point right now. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think Sandin is more of a – NHL player now I don't think he's a prospect I so yeah I but yeah Namel has looked really good so far and again we'll see what happens with, <laughs> with every prospect we'll see what happens yeah. we'll see how they develop because I mean I just want to say that like it, it kind of seems like we're pumping the tires a lot on Namela, but just you watch the clips I mean yeah. we're, we're, I'm not just yeah. saying this as like a Maple Leaf fan or a Maple Leaf writer he is really great I mean even yeah. that trade down just looks really good right now. So um, yeah. the fact that they were able to pick him up and the scouting staff, it, it's, just, it's just great, a great move on their part. Yeah, that's true. Well, t- well let's talk about another guy they traded down to get, uh, Roni Hervonen. Uh, he's looking very impressive in the league as well so far. It's to start the season, at least. Um, they did trade down to get him. Was that the right move to do this, uh, Greg? What do you think? I think anytime you can turn one draft pick into two draft picks is a good move, regardless of, you know, if that's the guy you were targeting. And if this was a guy that Dubas wanted and knew he was going to be there, then that moves even better. But uh, they gave up the, what was it, the 44th pick to get 59th and 64. So you're not exactly going too far down and you're getting two picks essentially in the same group of guys. Um, so yeah, that's a good move. I'm a big fan. Anytime you can add more assets to your, your organization, it's a good move. It's hard to argue with getting two for one essentially. And I think it was a pretty good pick. I mean, this is another kid that, um, you know, had a huge, uh, world junior summer showcase. I mean, he was, he was great in, in, in those few games, had a couple of hat tricks and, uh, you know, he, he's a guy that 
uh, unfortunately is going to be tagged with that dreaded U word, undersized, five foot nine at center. Not ideal, but when you watch him, um, you know, he does such a good job of, of using his body to leverage himself in situations. And he's really good. He's uh, at anticipating plays. He takes away passing and shooting lanes uh, very well. Um, and just when you were ready to bla like label him a defensive minded center, all of a sudden, boom, he explodes uh, for all these goals all of a sudden. So, you know, it could be one of those picks where a lot of other GMs are going to be wishing they, they uh, had taken him where he's at. But uh, as far as the trading down, as I said, it's, it's hard to argue, uh, you know, turning one into two. Yeah, no. And, and I say, if you're, if you're going to have, if you know that the guy's still going to be there when you're picking there, may as well get another pick because uh, you know, extra guys in the system is never bad. You never know who, who you're going to get more is obviously better. Uh, last question on this other prospects you're excited about in the system. Uh, Greg, you just talked. So we'll, we'll go back to you. Uh, who do you think is that you're excited about uh, other than the guys we've already talked about? Um, yeah. I mean, it's easy to pick the top of the, of the prospect chain. As far as excitement, I'm going to go down a little further. I don't know if exciting is is the right word to use for this player, but definitely intrigued. Uh, I like what I've seen in the past year from Philip Crawl. I think he's been, and I'm a big fan of value at the draft, where you can get turn those fifth, sixth, seventh round players into you know contributors at the NHL level. I love when that happens, and and uh, Crawl was was a fifth round pick back in 2018, and he had a really big season. Uh, back home in the Czech Republic last year, where he even jumped up to the top league and and played well, and was even tied for their uh, the team his team's leading points for the playoffs. Um, and then came over and played ten games with the Marlies, and didn't definitely didn't look out of place there. And I think he's going to have a really uh, big year for him playing a full season in the AHL. And and uh, you know he's a, he's a strong skater on the back end, which you're always looking for, but who could also can produce points. So. Uh, that's the guy I'm most intrigued about because, you know, I love those late round success stories and those diamonds in the rough. And he definitely falls under that category. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Nick, who's, who are you looking at? Uh, you're excited about in the system other than the top prospects. Well, there's a couple other late round, uh, gems from the 2020 draft that uh, are really intriguing. Uh, Dmitry Avchenikov had a massive season in the uh, MHL last year. He's still kind of struggling to secure a place on his KHL squad. He's kind of spending a lot of time on the bench there. Um, and V. Mietnin, who racked up award after award last season at St. Cloud State as a freshman playing for the Huskies there. Uh, I think he was also a fifth-round pick. So those guys are really exciting. But uh, I'm a big fan of Mikhail Abramov. I think he was a fourth rounder in the 2018 draft. Uh, really kind of rounded out his game to become a dual threat offensive player in the queue over the last few years since being drafted. He was more of a, kind of a playmaker going into his draft year. And after the Leafs selected him, he went back to Victoriaville. He became more of a, an assertive offensive player, relied on his shot a lot more, taking the puck into dangerous areas, taking away middle ice defensively. Um, he's really progressed well. He had a great showing at the rookie tournament. He, he led the team in scoring with six points through the four games. I, I think that he's going to be a guy that really adds some offensive punch to the Marlies this season. And I'm excited about that because the Marlies have kind of lacked that sort of exciting young talent in the last couple of years. It's been a lot of, you know, AHL journeymen with the odd mid-level prospects sprinkled in here and there. But, you know, we could potentially see Nick Robertson, Mikhail Abramov, Pavel Gogolev, Joey Anderson. You know, th there's a lot of guys to be excited about on the Marlies this year, too. So, uh, yeah, those are my guys. A big Abramov guy here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Abramov's a very, a very intriguing prospect to me, too. And uh, we'll see where, where they go. Uh, Peter, we'll finish with you on this one. Uh, who else are you excited to see? Well, I'm kind of glad Nick didn't take one of my players, because I thought he probably would have taken this guy as well. But um, no, I'm a big fan of Abramov as well. I mean, really starting to come into his own right now. But I'm interested to see what's going to happen with Nick Abersese. I'm um, glad you picked him. He, he <laughs> <worked out> well. <laughs> perfect. I, I, perfect. 
Um, given the fact that, you know, he, he has a lot of accolades to his name right now. He was a USHL first all-star team in 2018-19, rookie of the year in 2019-20, but didn't play in 2020-21 because NCAA or their league didn't play because of the pandemic. Now that, you know, the league is up and running, he's back with Harvard, he's going to be a key player for them. I hope that the main thing is that, you know, he was training in the off season. Hopefully he maintains, maintains, you know, the skill set, the drive, the determination, everything that he's known for in the past and getting into the game action. That to me is going to be a sticking point because when you miss a full year, it's going to be very difficult. We saw that with some of the OHLers last year and this year as well. Um, so there's just about his game itself. There's so much to love about it. Yeah. Again, Greg with the dreaded, <laughs> Uh, you know, OU word under or undersized OS, <laughs> undersized US, um, undersized player. But he has he has great positioning of his body to protect the puck and kind of like Ronnie Hirvonen. And I'm even going to throw in Marco Rossi as well. They mm-hmm. both, they're smaller guys, but they know how to protect the puck so well. And I think the fact that I even wrote about him as part of like the top five profit prospects previously before, you know, all these other prospects came in, he's always wanting to learn more and improve his game. And I think that to me is a sticking point. And now that Ryan Hardy is part of the Maple Leafs organization, a former player that played under him with the Chicago Steel, kind of has that familiarity that they're both products of the Maple Leafs system right now. So if he's able to come out flying in Harvard like he did in his rookie year, I think the Maple Leafs still have a really great value pick in him. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm going to throw in my opinion on uh, I I really like Will and Bill enough. Um, defenseman drafted in the fourth round in 2020. Uh, he did play a couple games with the Marlies, but uh, of course, because he's back, going to be back in the queue. It was only two games. I mean, probably not a lot to really see what he can do. Um, he was 58 points in his draft year. He has some offensive upside. I think uh, he's going to be very interesting to watch what he can do in the queue this year and uh, in the future as well. So I'll throw his name in the mix. Um, to finish the show, as we always do, uh, quick fire questions. Around the horn, we'll just go around with, with these questions. First one, who will be the better player, Nick Robertson or Rodan Amirov? Nick, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> Nick Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, what do you think about? Um, I don't think he necessarily classifies as a prospect, but he's in the system, and I really never mind. I, I'm looking at the wrong question. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it shows that. where my head is at right now. I'm gonna. Say, I mean, yeah, you. Nick Robertson has a skill set, but Rodian Amirov has the more well-rounded game. Um, it's hard to compare because they're two different style players, but they both bring something to the table that makes them so special. And it's really hard to pick one over the other, but if we're going for, you know, complete package player, absolutely Rodian Amirov. If we're going for the high octane offenses and speed, then Nick Robertson. But I think it's neck and neck. Uh, it's really hard to put them one above the other. And even when I did my top 10 prospects, I did one A, one B, Robertson and Mirov. It's too difficult. Well, if I knew it was like, I thought it was rapid fire. That's what I said. uh... I was about to say, say, Nick went right on with the rapid fire. I'm going to take the rapid fire. (laughs) But but Pete, what Pete said. Yeah. <laughs> I try to keep it as short as possible. <laughs> Greg, what do you think? Robertson or Amiro? Yeah, it kind of echo what Pete said. I think Amirov is the safer bet to be the better all-around player, but Robertson has the higher ceiling and be more the dynamic player. But I'll, I'll go with Robertson just because uh, he's got that scoring ability, and I like that uh, he likes to do a little bit of the trash talk and get under people's skins too. <laughs> that uh, that that's an underrated skill set. True, yeah. I love that, that was that kind of the separator side. for me too. <laughs> that feisty side at the rookie tournament that that was top notch. Yeah, yeah. And hey, Peter, you're good with the segue there. Uh, rookie tournament. Who <laughs> caught your eye at the rookie tournament? It's probably what you were looking down at. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, this is where I had my little gaffe cause I'm looking at the wrong question. Um, but yeah, he doesn't really classify as a prospect in the system, but I really liked Matt Hellickson. Um, he, being paired with Joseph Duzek, um, as that top pairing go-to pairing for the Maple Leafs, not known for his offense, but man, he found the back of the net quite a bit with three goals. And I really loved his ability to be that two way minded. Again, I'm a big sucker for two way players. I want the offense and I want the defense. And he was really good at both ends and he scored some key goals, even though, you know, in the past, he really hasn't shown that offensive instinct. So maybe he's starting to come into his own, um, you know, I, I don't know if he'll make it to the NHL level at some point, but he does have promise and maybe going to, he's definitely going to be an AHL player this year, but I, I, I just really liked his play. And then Greg to you, who do you, uh, who caught your eye at that rookie tournament? Well, it's easy. It would be easy to say Robertson, but that's what you were expecting to see, I think in those <laughs> games. So uh, outside of him, I'm actually going to go uh, with Peter's line of thinking. I was, I went with Joseph Duzik. I think he was really good too. Again, he was kind of one of those where you're like, eh, he's 24. Should he be here really? <laughs> but you know what? He, you saw exactly what you wanted to see out of a 24 year old playing against teenagers. He was a class above pretty much everybody else there. And that's, that's, you didn't want him to go there and look bad against, yeah. you know, guys that were just drafted. So, um, and as, as Peter said, he, for, he had a really good showing um, with Hellickson. I think maybe you got a preview of one of your top uh, pairings there with the Marlies this season that they can uh, build off of that. So, um, you know, for the, for the AHL fans out there, that's something to be excited about. If they can keep that momentum going into the season, they could have a, a formidable pairing there, but, you know, he's, he just stood out. Uh, he, he was, he was the best defenseman, um, in that group in those games and, and should be based on his experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Nick, what, uh, what do you think, uh, of that rookie tournament uh, who stood up for you? Um, I, I don't know if necessarily stood out, but I, I thought there were some encouraging signs in Semyon Durgashev. Semyon Durgashev, man, that's that's one of the toughest <laughs> names in hockey. I don't care what anyone says. I was actually uh, going to pick him, but I didn't because I didn't want to butcher his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I wish you had now, Greg. Uh, <laughs> no, we'll go with SDA. Um, I, I thought uh, there were some encouraging signs in his game at the rookie tournament. Uh, he, he looks a little bit stronger out there. He was playing through traffic a little more than we've seen in the past. He's a guy that sort of sticks the, to the perimeter, scans the play from a distance, and tries to pick apart traffic with his passing ability in that way. Um, it, he was definitely getting after it a little more in the rookie tournament. I thought he got better as it went along. I think maybe overcorrected a little bit with the, uh, with the shot selection. He <laughs> started kind of shooting everything when – he would shoot nothing before. Uh, I think if he can kind of find that balance and s stay true to what makes him uh, a successful player, and that's his playmaking and vision, if he can find that balance, I'm expecting big things out of SDA with the Marlies this year, especially after kind of a tough year last year. He, yeah. he showed well in a, in a brief stint over in the KHL, had some injury trouble over there. I thought he kind of struggled a little bit with the adjustment to the American League when he came over. So seeing those signs out of him at the rookie tournament was definitely encouraging. Yeah, I, I just wish the Canucks had a rookie tournament. We didn't have that one. So <laughs> <laughs> seeing all these other rookie tournaments go on and I'm like, I'm missing something. Yeah, um, yeah so hopefully next year. Um, next, most underrated uh, prospect in the system it should be getting more attention. Uh, Greg, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, this was a tough one, um, but I'm going to go more underestimated and underrated. Maybe may the same thing, but I'm actually going to go back to somebody we talked about early and, and Timothy Lilgren, because I think he's being underestimated a little bit, but maybe not. Um, but I think it's mostly because it's been four years since he was taken in the first round. Yeah. And it's like, as, as Nick said earlier, like how long do you get to be a prospect before you're not a prospect and you just, not worth the pick anymore and I think we're kind of at that point uh, it's the last year of his of his uh, entry-level deal um it's so it's so frustrating because there's times with the Marlies the last couple of seasons he's looked dominant out there he's looked great and they just can't 
get that at the NHL level. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of people are down on him and it could possibly be even people within the organization that are down on him too. Um, so I think there's where your underrated, under underestimated uh, comes in. Um, but, you know, if he doesn't prove it soon, then maybe he's rated exactly where he yeah. should be. But uh, we'll find out sooner rather than later. I think if, if the NHL... Uh, if he doesn't cement himself in the NHL this year, uh, he's going to be one of those quote unquote change of scenery guys. And uh, we'll see where he ends up. Yeah. Nick, uh, underrated prospects. I'm going to go with Ty Voigt, a uh, kid that the Leafs drafted in the fifth round uh, this past draft. I think uh, yeah, another OHL player who didn't get to play in his draft year, I think had the OHL had their season, Ty Voigt probably wouldn't have been there in the fifth round for the Leafs. Yeah. Uh, I think he, had another like high energy offensive player with outstanding vision and passing ability, wicked hands can kind of be around you in a phone booth sort of thing. Um, he's kind of getting undervalued, I think, just because he's off the radar for, for so long. But I think when the OHL returns this year and he's getting into regular game action with Sarnia again, I think people are, are going to take notice pretty quickly. He's going to turn some heads. He's just a dynamic offensive threat and the the dreaded you word yet again, and, and an undersized player, but he, he's added some size to his frame in the last couple of years. You know, it, there's not a whole lot of difference between five eleven and six feet. We just try to pretend there is. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that, uh, he's definitely a kid to be excited about. He's going to be someone that kind of climbs the, the Leafs prospect rankings over the course of the next year, I think. Yeah. Um, Peter, we'll finish up with on this with you, uh, underrated prospects that you see. I'm going to go with Miko Kokonen, um, mainly because of the fact that, and I'm going back to the 2017 draft where they drafted Emilie Rassanen, and he just fell off the depth charts uh, with the Maple Leafs. And I think he was supposed to be what they wanted with uh, Kokonen. And given the fact that he is not as big as Rassanen, but he's got the smarts, he's got the two-way ability, he's more projects as a defensive stalwart in a third-pairing role in the future. But I, even, I was even surprised with his play last year. Um, you know, just offensive production in general, 10 points in 50 games with Eucharit at the in the Liga, but then comes over to North America for the Marlies for 11, to play in 11 games, and he has seven points. So that point per game average slightly went up and he's not known for his offensive ability. So that was great. That was great projection. Sorry. Uh, he's scoring a bit early on this year too, with his new team in Liga. Yeah. And, and, and that's the main thing. Uh, his offensive production as well. Uh, it, it's, it's starting to come into his own right now. And I think maybe he's not going to be just that defensive minded, but that, you know, puck distributor, you know, quickly move the play up. Um and yeah, I, I, I'm actually very excited for him because I think he's that bottom six, ideal bottom six pairing that you would want that could eat up minutes, penalty kill, and just get the puck out quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, the, tw the last uh, few drafts, I think the Maple Leafs have gotten some good uh, undervalued picks. Uh, guys that, you know, that are those diamonds in the rough that so you may be able to get uh, something out of that are in the later rounds. And uh, we'll, like I say, we'll see what happens. Um, looking forward, probably way too early, but of course, we're all prospects, guys. We are looking towards the 2022 draft. Um, if the Maple Leafs end up keeping it, which is not a guarantee, they've traded it away a couple times. Um, we'll see what they do this year because, you know, they're going to be in the playoff hunt. They may want to upgrade something, trade their first round pick like they did and got Nick Felino, who is now with the Boston Bruins. So they didn't really get anything from him. After that first round pick, uh, Nick, we'll start with you. Who do you think they would pick if they keep that first round pick early on? This is very early, but what do you think? Very early on. So I, I'm going to pretend that this is a dream world and we're picking 32nd overall. <laughs> uh, <laughs> love it. Um, that's a really good question. I, I like some of the. I like Antonin Vero a lot at a Gatineau. I think he's a guy that'll be in that, you know, 20, 25 range, maybe. It, again, it's way too early to say, but but right now, 
a couple guys out of the queue, Vero and I really like Marcus Bitacek and Halifax as well. I think those are guys that are going to be in that early second round, late first round kind of conversation as the season goes on. And I feel this draft is a lot of people are saying it's shallow. I, I think it actually is another really solid draft is like, I think it's a deep draft. I just yeah, looking I, at it early. Yeah. I'm, I'm really enjoying, you know, the viewings that I've had on, I'm still focusing on a lot of the guys near the top of the most public boards right now. Yeah. It's, it's early on yeah. in the season. Right. But it, yeah, I, I'm really impressed with the, the depth of talent, at least near the top of the draft this coming year. Yeah. Um, Peter, uh, who do you have pegged for the Maple Leafs at this early point of the season? <laughs> well, I hope they could surpass the Buffalo Sabres and get the first and trash chain right, but <laughs> ideal world, right? Um, I, I, I have two in mind, and I'm going to throw Tyler Brennan and Paul Ludwinski, and Tyler Brennan mainly because of the fact that, you know, probably a late first, early second, the goaltending is probably not as strong as what we've seen in the past with Spencer Knight, um, Askarov, Wallstead, but he does have really great technical skill and he's got great size and addresses a need where the Maple Leafs are pretty, not necessarily str- uh, strong in goaltending. They have great prospects, but I think Tyler Brennan would probably be at the top of that prospect uh, position for the Maple Leafs. And Paul Ludwinski, I mean, I had him as an honorable mention, but he's looking really good playing just on the second line underneath Shane Wright. And he's got really great speed, great shot, great awareness. Um, saw, I th- saw a bit of him with the Marlboros when he was in the GTHL previously. Uh, but I think if it, like one player that wanted the benefit from last season and missing it, it's like off to a really hot start this year, it's going to be Paul Ludwinski. And I think he fits that mold, very high energy, great skill, center depth. I think that he's a Maple Leaf kind of player. Yeah, and I think the Maple Leafs should keep it regardless of where they are because they need to re- they need to stock on some high end talent just like the Canucks as well. They keep the first round pick. I mean, it's <laughs> just <laughs> saying. Um, Greg, we'll finish off with you. Uh, who do you see the Maple Leafs picking depending on where they finish? Well, uh, as the outsider looking in from here in Chicago, according to Maple Leafs Twitter, half of you guys think it's going to be that thirty second pick overall and the other half think it's going to be the number one overall pick. so i really don't know who to look at here so um my advice as somebody who has gone through sour cap hell in chicago keep the freaking pick don't yeah. trade it <laughs> i don't care where you're picking make the pick you've got to keep those young talent coming through you've got your core identified much like the blackhawks did in 2010 and in that part, you've got your core, they're locked up, they're rather expensive. So you need that young, cheap talent to keep plugging in. And if you're con- consistently not picking in the first round, that talent pool to pick from gets worse and worse with each yeah. passing year. This is something the Blackhawks struggled with, and they still struggle with to this day. So keep the pick <laughs> for crying out loud. For every <laughs> trade deadline, for every Ron Francis or Butch Goring success story, there's 10 Nick Felinos or Andrew Lads <laughs> at the trade deadline. They don't work out as great as many think they do. A lot of times, they don't. One was the last trade deadline guy you heard of that won a con Smythe trophy you know just use that trade deadline to fill in the small pieces yeah. that that third pairing defenseman that fourth line center that's going to play defense and win faceoffs. you don't try and get a superstar on that trade deadline that's where general managers shoot themselves in the foot all the time i get it everybody is dying for a stanley cup up there in toronto but you also got to remember that you know three years down the road, you could still be just as good of of a contender. So you got to, you know, keep that in mind too. So I don't know who to pick. Identify the position you want at wherever you're picking and go for the best guy there. I like the idea of Brennan and a goaltender. The Maple Leafs definitely need to have uh, some better goaltending prospects uh, there. So um, I don't care who they pick, just make a first round pick. That will, that will satisfy me. And this has been the rant section of the show. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm, good, I'm well, good for I'm good for one in every show, no matter what show I'm on. I'm good for one rant. I was actually waiting for him to say, "Don't pick a Nolan Allen kind of player." That's like a third or fourth round of the first. That's another good one. Yeah. Hey, he's I already like got Nolan his level contract. He's going to prove me wrong. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
I, I echo all that in Vancouver because the Canucks haven't picked in the first round for two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pod Colson was the last one. And he is also the last one that uh, the Canucks have coming up in the system that's potentially a lead. I uh, really like what Danilo Klimovic has done in training camp so far, and he's second round pick. Um, first round pick talent, I think, from just seeing what he's done so far, very raw. Again, these are guys that you're drafting in the later rounds. I mean, second round's not later, but guys that are kind of hit or miss. And sometimes you hit, sometimes you miss. And in the later rounds, most of the time you miss. So, I mean, it's it's unfortunate with – there's so many guys that get drafted that never make the NHL. First rounders and second rounders are probably the closest you can get to sure things. Keep those picks. I mean, like Greg said, I mean – yeah, you'll get sometimes the guys that'll push over the top as superstars. A lot of the time you don't. I mean, looking back at a lot of these Stanley Cup winners, who are the guys that stand out? The third and fourth liners. Uh, Tampa Bay Lightning had a third line. Granted, all three of them weren't third line players. Like Blake Coleman was a top six guy in uh, New Jersey. So, But again, they were third liners. Um, so, I mean... Yeah, everything that Greg said, I'll, I'll echo because the Canucks have been going through the same thing the last two years. Keep the first round pick. That's the last word of the show. So a lot uh, of good slogans <laughs> for for prospects on, on this show. We'll see what happens. Yeah, Keep yeah. The pick. <laughs> Great potential. Yeah. <laughs> Moving forward, looking forward, yeah, future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a you lot of that. stuff. You got here. The cliches, you know, they always work. We should we should change the name of the show from Prospects Corner to We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> the tagline. It's the tagline. <laughs> that that's good to finish off the show. So this has been the Prospects Corner, uh, presented by the Hockey Writers. Again, if you've enjoyed this show, subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, hit the like button. And of course, comment on anything you hear in the shows. We love to hear your comments. We haven't had a lot yet, but I mean. We're still getting established. I'm sure we'll get the comments when the, when the draft starts to get going. We start saying who teams should pick. Um, so, I mean, definitely leave your comments below. We'll for sure get to them uh, and talk about it on future episodes. Uh, check out thehockeywriters.com. Of course, we have so much writing out there right now with training camps and preseason getting going here. So, I mean, hockey's back, everyone. This is awesome. Uh, we've been waiting for it. I mean, yes, it's been a, a very – short i guess a short off season but i don't know when there's no hockey it seems like it's very long uh so i mean thanks for joining us uh for peter greg and nick this is matthew and uh we'll see you next time in the prospects corner see you later guys <laughs>